Okie dokie. Um, firstly, thanks very much to Eza for bullying me here today. Um, she's been the, one of the main focus or one of the main drivers of some of this work, so she said you've got to come, so thanks for that. Um, I'm going to be talking today about an area that is a bit probably obscure to a lot of you, I suspect. Um, so before I launch into some of the kind of results and things we've found, and I should say uh, I've got some results, I've also got sort of broad ideas. Uh, I wanted to talk and spend a little bit of time on some context stuff. Um, there's a couple of reasons for this. One, New Zealand's about as far away from where we are here as you could possibly get. Um, and the other reason is the archaeology is a bit obscure, as I said. So uh, I was genuinely asked when I came to UCL uh, if this was our archaeology, it's the Lord of the Rings stuff. Um, it's not, so it's, a, it's all a bit more, more ephemeral than that. But I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so the point of that is not just to sort of give you the background on New Zealand, but it's also hopefully to link some of the questions that we're asking with broader themes globally, which I actually think in a weird way, um, while New Zealand is a very late prehistory, while it's a very different prehistory, it does connect quite nicely to some of the themes that you see uh, around the world. So um, I'm going to start even broader than New Zealand very quickly uh, and talk a little bit more about the Pacific because this is the, the really jumping off point. So um, New Zealand down the bottom there, so to the southwest of this big kind of shark fin shaped thing you can see there. Um, the other corner is being Rapa Nui or Easter Island as many of you will know, and ha the Hawaiian Islands at the top. Now this area is what most people call Polynesia. So in here you have um, a, the societies within this region are ancestrally linked, uh, ancestral cultural connections, of course that means they've got very similar genetics, very similar linguistics. And to a large extent, the degree to which these societies are similar or different from one another is to do with um, the uh, settlement process in the region. So very, very, very quickly, um, there's about three uh, broad pulses of settlement. The first comes out to the first red arrow you can see there, the dotted line, uh, and that's in the Pleistocene, that settles Australia, New Guinea, all that sort of thing. The second pulse doesn't occur until around 3,500 BP with the Lapita people, and that's the first truly oceanic um, movement of people. And that sweeps along the top of New Guinea, I'm just going to do my weatherman impression, um, it sweeps along the top of New Guinea coming out as far as Samoa and Tonga. And that takes about 500 years, so it's, it's, that's a long way in a, very, in a very short time. Once they get to Samoa and Tonga they stop for about 2,000 years. Um, and this is, this is what I mean by it's kind of interesting to see how these things overlate, uh, over, or relate to continental environments. So once they get to Samoa and Tonga there's a pause of about 2,000 years and there's the development of what you might call an ancestral Polynesian society, which then explodes out over the rest of this triangle in about 300 years. And this triangle is, a, is about a quarter of the Earth's surface, so we're not talking about small distances here. It also gets to South America and comes back as well. So it's, a, it's very rapid. Um, now the nature of that settlement is, again, very similar to what you see elsewhere. Uh, it's what you might call a Neolithic package, I suppose, uh, what we call a transported cultural landscape. So people are taking plants, animals, ideas, beliefs, all that sort of stuff with them are uh, two new islands. Um, and the other thing, I, just, I suppose this is the real jumping off point and the reason I talk more broadly about Polynesia, um, is that you can see that an awful lot of this movement from, from west to east is happening in that tropical band. And if we think about this in terms of some of Peter Bellwood's ideas about the movement of horticulturalists and agriculturalists, the speed of that settlement probably shouldn't be that surprising in that it is going along relatively similar climatic ranges. Um, I'd hasten to add there are fairly serious differences locally here, but in general terms there is this kind of similarity. But you can see, I, hope, I think you can probably see the point I'm about to make, you can see the big exception to this is down here. This is a massive jump, and this is a north-south jump against the grain climatically, so to speak. And this is what Bell would, re would refer to as a high friction move. So this is, a, this is a difficult move to move down across things like that. Now for us, um, what this means of course is that we have to consider exactly how these people with a, a culture that's adapted to a tropical environment has made this jump. I mean, and this isn't the equivalent of say moving um, along the same latitude perhaps over ground because there is no transitional point here. Uh, people come from the Southern Cooks and they move 2,000 miles down to New Zealand, probably took about a month so that one month they're in a tropical environment, the next they might be in a temperate environment. So this is a pretty big, uh, pretty big change. And you can also see one last sort of footnote, New Zealand sits across because it's very long and thin. It's a, a, New Zealand's approximately the same landmass as the UK, uh, but it's longer. So um, it sits across those different 
bands. So we might expect some differences. Um, so in terms of what we kind of think we know in New Zealand, um, uh, there are some serious problems. Um, what we do know is that that movement south lowers productivity. So um, of the 20 odd species of plants that Polynesians take with them to other islands, six or five or six, depending on who you listen to, actually get established in New Zealand. And the yield of those plants is around about half as much as it is elsewhere. You just can't get the yield off them as much. Um, the Jumping down to the bottom one, the concentration of this yield is very much up here. This is a distribution map of hill fort sites, effectively, which are associated with agricultural land. So you can see there's a, a big concentration up there. Uh, and the final thing to say is that the very bottom half of the South Island is too cold for dom uh, domesticated species. So there's no horticulture there whatsoever. So there you see uh, quite a clear reversion to hunter-gathering and foraging. Uh, Population-wise, uh, all these things, of course, are interconnected. Um, the lower yields mean that, generally speaking, the estimates are a bit dodgy, but um, generally speaking, New Zealand population is considered to be much lower than the per, um, per kilometre squared uh, readings or, or, or numbers that we get from elsewhere, like Hawaii or places like that. And it's not just lower, it's much lower. Uh, in the, but in terms of our models of what population actually looks like, we just sort of steal them from Polynesia. Um, and generally speaking, it's the logistic model where there's horticulture, and below this line here, which is the non-horticultural region down here, we assume some kind of collapse um, associated with the, the loss of faunal resources, which is the mainstay of the economy down there. Um, now, you might expect, what I was talking about with friction, you might expect there to be a concentration of people in the north early, um, because that's the most similar um, to the environments that, that people came from. But in fact, what we find is that there's an awful lot of settlement down here, which is the concept where, the, where the large game resources are concentrated. But again, hasten to add, there's some problems with, I'm sure there's some problems with preservation and recovery bias here. Um, and so these, these settlements are based around exploitation of wild game, basically hunting out patches and then moving on. And what happens in terms of this area that I'm quite interested in, in terms of this horticultural zone, is that because most of the data is from here, what happens is people just pick it up and dump it over uh, up in the North Island. And that doesn't seem particularly useful. So that's a sort of starting point. We have generic models from Polynesia that aren't necessarily that useful. We have a lot of derived models from other regions that might not be that useful in terms of understanding the, the development and the actual establishment of, of food producing systems. And we have no real empirical checks of either of them. So um, with for his sins, Enrico Prima um, has been working with me a little bit on some of this population stuff. So we're trying to deal a little bit with trying to address what the actual population models look like, and rather than just these sort of broad generic models. I think a lot, given the audience, I'm, I'm going to assume that most of you are familiar with the SPD method and R carbon, which Enrico and Andy Bevan have developed. So I'm not going to talk specifically about the details necessarily, but just some of the results. Um, so what we did first, just sort of broadly divided up New Zealand into optimal, suboptimal, and non-horticultural zones. We were interested to see if that temporal banding that we talked about here had an impact on population, and we expected that, that it would. Um, and we then compared it, we used a model testing approach that I haven't shown here, compared it to just a basic logistic, fitted logistic model. Uh, and what we found, broadly speaking, was that horticultural zone logistic growth was pretty fair. Um, I should hasten to add, this isn't what I'm talking about. I'll talk about that further in a second. Uh, so in, where there's horticulture, logistic, logistic growth is a pretty a reasonable model. But in the south, it didn't work at all. Uh, and we, we sort of expected that. So then we use the permutation test. And so what this does, um, for those that don't know, is rather than compare our data with uh, an idealized model, what we're doing here is comparing each region with the underlying growth trend across the whole country. So what we're trying to find out here is to what extent does a, a one particular region vary from... Uh, the overall growth around New Zealand. Um, and you, you can see, if I start with the south, you can see that uh, our observed data vastly overshoots the expectations of the model in that early period, and undershoots, represented by the blue, the bottom here, uh, in the later period. And this 1450 date lines up almost bang on with the, with the um, decline of large or big game resources in the south. So we were, quite, we were reasonably happy with that, and we felt that, that was a, there's a reasonable connection to be made there with food producing. Or, or the nature of, of uh, where you're getting your food. But in the north, uh, whereas most archaeologists would argue that it's just logistic, we found 
um, that when you use the permutation test, you can tease out a little bit more data than that. So um, in the first instance, I just say that there is, you can see that the, the early period there is in the blue in both the central and northern regions uh, is undershooting the expectations of the model. So perhaps you could argue that this is an opportunity cost for establishing, um, for not going after the big Kentucky Fried Chicken down in the South Island um, and seals and all the rest of it, but actually trying to establish a more uh, solid base of resources. Um, but you can see very much in the later period, this is completely different. That most of the growth is on trend with the model or exceeding it. Uh, and one more thing that I'll just mention very quickly is that it's quite interesting to note that in the north, um, that, that initial boom, that red area that you can see in the middle there, um, fits quite nicely with some of the oral traditions uh, that we have. It suggests that that's the concentration of early uh, growth, and that actually there's a sort of recolonization of the central zone uh, by Māori groups after that. And we're actually picking that up in the central region a little bit as well, I think, uh, with this red area here, which is suggesting that growth is exceeding the expectations of our model. So we, we, we can maybe connect that to some of the oral traditions as say of internal population movements, um, which is not only sort of refining our understanding of population, but also perhaps um, lining up quite nicely with some of the oral traditions, which in New Zealand are quite solid and quite nice. Um, we've done a little bit more work that focuses on sort of sub-regional patterns as well, um, but I've decided not to sort of talk about that. But broadly speaking, that sort of breaks down even the classifications that we have here, and it suggests that you know that, that uh, local variation is quite important as well. So beyond region, or even a finer scale than regional. So just to wrap up very quickly, I've only got a few minutes left. Um, the ABM aspect, and as I said, this is very much in development. Um, basically, this is born out of the problem that we have in New Zealand, which is that. We have this model of settlement that is um, largely based on something that isn't really appropriate, but the, we, we don't have an awful lot of sites that we can say, um, look, this is, this is what's going on. We certainly don't have almost any early horticultural sites. They are there, but they're very rare. And so rather than trying to establish what's going on there by using the very small data points that we have, um, talking to ESA, we sort of started thinking about using agent-based modeling to get at this issue by just trying to sort of theory build, I suppose, or model build using ABM. Uh, so it's very simple, it's just a question of how uh, groups of people might settle um, high friction, unfamiliar environments, given certain parameters. Um, and so what we would hopefully, hopefully do is sort of compare the, the different models that we come up with and also try and then compare that to the arche what archaeological data we do have. So it's a relatively simple method, and we're in really, you know, it's very early stages yet, but it's just focusing on the cluster, on clustered resources, which is very much the case in New Zealand. There's a lot of areas that you can grow crops, a lot of areas that you can't. And um, we're just asking a simple question. Of, um, basically, uh, if somebody moves into a new environment and they satisfy, so they're, they're happy with what they can see, um, what happens if they invest heavily in that area? They put all their eggs in one basket. And what happens if they perhaps do that process uh, get some crops up and running and then decide to move on and, and try that on a sort of a loop. And of course each have got costs because if there's some kind of stochastic process that they're not aware of or if climate goes bad or, or just that they've chosen the wrong place, if they've invested heavily there's obviously a massive problem with that. Um, however if they move on they've got the problem of transportation and trying to reap those gardens. So it's just as I say very early stages but that's what we're sort of trying to get at. So I will with that finish up. Thanks very much. Thank <laughs> you.